Ow. This is so fun to be back. You're a good looking group. Look at somebody and say, you're good looking. Look at them there. All right. Man, how fun it is for me to be back here at Central. Some of you, of course, uh, you're new maybe to Central and you're saying, well, who is this guy? Yeah, and uh, believe me, uh, most of the stories are not true. Uh, <laughs> And, and it, it really is fun to be back. I grew up in this church. I was a junior high kid in the back row over in that section, rolling little uh, communion cup uh, holders down the road to see who would see it underneath the pews. Um, I see so many familiar faces, but so many new faces too, and that's awesome. In January, my father and I were here to uh, share with you kind of your last Sunday before you had your 80th celebration of 80 years. And my father and I shared in a little message, and I mentioned to you back then, I said, you know what, change is inevitable. It's the misery that's optional. <laughs> and change has happened in this place, and it's awesome. Yeah. It really is awesome. I am really proud of you. It is a tough thing. Way to go. It's a tough thing to be an 80-year-old church and to realize you got to change with what's happening in society with the same message that is unchangeable. Amen? Amen. Amen. Good. Two of you are with me. All right. <laughs> I, I, let, me, let me just tell you, I want to I tell you a little bit about the school, but it's not going to be a whole commercial. That's a great little video. If you haven't been up to Rockland, you new folks need to realize that it's this church that started San Jose Bible College in 1939, some 80 years ago. This church. You have outgiven any other church. I'm not just saying that because I'm with you. I don't say that to the Presbyterians and the Baptists, okay? When I'm here in front of you, I'm telling you the truth. You have outgiven every other church that we are partners with, and we thank you. And you have made such an incredible difference in the kingdom of God. Last week, in fact, you had two of our alum, uh, alumni speak, Jeff Phillips and Jim Yost. Very proud of them, fantastic men of God, and they were students at the school that my grandfather started because he first started with God, Central Christian Church. And you all have stood with us as a campus. I think there's a picture. Do we have a picture uh, of the students on the front ramp? There's about 1,800 students now. 1,800. Uh, what you see there is about 1,000 of them, the young ones, uh, the 18 to 22-year-olds living on campus, playing sports and everything. And we have about 800 adults, some, in fact, about 150 right here in San Jose at our, our new campus here in San Jose, Least Facility. I brought some materials with me. I'd love for you to take our latest magazine. I put a little stack out there. If you're not on the mailing list, love to have you receive these magazines. God's doing some wonderful, wonderful stuff. And we're just so excited to be on the ride with him. I tell you, we never really could have imagined what the school might look like as we're now up in Rockland. And uh, we do miss the Bay Area. I don't miss the traffic, but... We do miss the Bay Area. We do miss being able to be here with you more often. But thank you for your prayers and for your support. Do you realize now we have almost 50 different programs you can be involved in? We're still training pastors and missionaries. And in fact, I started a little preaching club not too long ago because there were many students coming into our business program, into our pre-med program, into our pre-law program, even aviation. Can you believe that? We have aviation now? And that's not to fly RC uh, planes, you know. Uh, that's actually in partnership with a, an airport in Lincoln or in uh, Auburn. And we actually offer an aviation degree now. But we are continuing to train pastors and missionaries and Christian educators. And I started a preaching club because I realized we had students in all these other degrees who really do have a heart for the Lord and they want to share his word. And so I started a preaching club. I got about 15 students in this preaching club, and none of them are even in our ministry degree program, and yet two of them are out preaching this morning. One all the way up in Greenville, California, and one in Wheatland, California. They're preaching this morning to small congregations of the love of Christ. Well, this picture that you see, uh, those are the daytime students. And then in the bottom set there on the right, that's the picture my grandfather took in 1939 of the very first class at San Jose Bible College. I love to show it because, you know, to get a thousand students onto the ramp, I'm actually in a scissor lift with our cameraman, and I'm on a scissor lift with a bullhorn trying to get them all organized. And how do you get a thousand students to come out onto the ramp? I'm missing a whole bunch of them, but I was feeling pretty good when I realized there were actually 14 students in the first class of San Jose Bible College in 1939, and only 13 of them showed up for the picture. <laughs> 
So I felt much better that I wasn't able to get them all to, uh, onto the ramp. Well, let me tell you this uh, real quick, because some of you know my family uh, well, and we appreciate so much your prayers uh, for my family. Some of you know my mom had a stroke two years ago, and uh, she's in a care home. Um, she's not really doing much better, uh, but she is healthy, and she smiles when she sees us, and she can't get many words out and can't use her right side, can't walk and can't talk. Um, but God is good, and my dad's out there visiting her frequently. And uh, this uh, summer, my wife and I uh, heard that my father uh, left the burner on and, uh, you know, boiled some uh, uh, eggs dry or whatever it was he was boiling on the stove. And, and I said, Pop, is it time? And he said, yeah, anytime you're ready. So my wife and I decided it was time to move in with him. You see, he had a house that had the master bed on one side and all the other bedrooms on the other side of the house, so there was kind of a good distinction. Our house was one long hallway, and we decided we'd be better to move in with him. But I said, Pop, what I want to do is I want to build a little wall, because we want to have a little privacy, your side, my side, that kind of thing. My wife and I have a little privacy, that kind of thing. And so I'm building this wall in the living room. I'm, I'm pretty handy. I was putting up the sheetrock, and I'm starting to feel real bad. I'm building a wall between my father and I. And I think, this is terrible. What am I doing? Right then, he came out of his bedroom into the bathroom in his tidy whities And I said, no, the wall is a good thing. <laughs> None of us should be subject to seeing an 84-year-old man walking around in his tidy whities Can I get an amen? amen? We're family. I hope you can live with some of these stories, because this is what you're going to get from me this morning, transparency and reality, because we're all going to face our aging family. And we're going to face our aging selves in the mirror someday. Well, you know, as I was thinking about this message, I was thinking, uh, Tim, whom I really appreciate having getting to know him, he said, hey, it's kind of that free Sunday, come and share whatever you'd like to share. And I thought, you know, a lot of times preaching is a lot like going in to the, see the, the doctor, you know. You go in and they, they try to tell you the truth on things. I, I, I just changed from one provider to another. So this summer I finally decided, hey, I get a free checkup. I'll go on in and see my new doctor. I go in. I'm sitting down in the exam room. It's just regular chair, you know, not up on the exam table. But I'm sitting down in this exam chair. In comes my doctor. And she doesn't say a word to me. She just comes in front looking in my chart. And she looks up at me and says, oh, you need to lose nine pounds. You need to lose nine pound. I said, what? She said, you need to lose nine pound. I said, uh, <laughs> uh, hi. <laughs> I, I, I'm Jim. And she goes, you, you like to eat bread? I said, yeah. She goes, oh, you need to stop that. I said, wow. I said, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I looked at her and I thought to myself, how much is that like us coming to church? The preacher's trying to tell us what's best. We say, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I'm not really sure I want that news. I'm not really sure I'm too interested. Got quiet in here. <laughs> Let me challenge you a little bit. Uh, right after I remind you, because I almost forgot, that your name hangs on the entryway of our chapel. Isn't that cool? It's a brand new, brand new church partnership signboard, and uh, we've got Central Christian up there, partners since 1939, the day of our beginning of the school. Well, I wanted, wanted to bring to you this little message this morning. What I'm going to tell you about is, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the cost of faithfulness. The cost of faithfulness. Because... Since it was kind of a free Sunday, you know, a Sunday you're not in a series and I get to speak whatever I wanted to, I thought, you know, I really would like to share with you something that impacted my life a few years ago as I was reading through Scripture. And I just decided to title this, The Cost of Faithfulness. You see, Christianity, for so many of us, I think is, it can be, it can be kind of cheap and easy. That Christianity is something that we, we believe in, but we're not really sure that we have faith. We, we would believe in something, but not actually have faith in it. Martin Luther said, a faith that costs nothing is worth nothing. 
A faith that costs nothing is worth nothing. You can believe something is true, but not put your faith in it. We have many things that we believe in that are true, but we don't necessarily put our faith in them. And I have a simple illustration here. You may have seen this before. Some of you have been in the church for years. You've probably seen this, and I may not do it justice, but I'm just going to do the best that I can. In the fact that this chair, though you didn't see anyone sit in it, and I haven't sat in it, and um, it looks comfortable. I believe that chair would hold me. And that's belief. But the chair will hold me. Simple illustration now, okay? But some of you who are visual learners, maybe this will help you understand the difference between just believing in this God that we follow and really putting your faith in him. I believe this chair could hold me. In fact, I could take this chair around to some other churches, maybe, if Tim would let me, and I could preach about this chair. I could preach about how comfortable this chair actually is. Boy, it looks comfortable. Look at that. And, and, and that this chair, it looks pretty sturdy, and I believe that chair would hold me up, but that's only belief until I do what? Yeah, until I go and sit in it. And until I, I sit, I'm not exercising that belief. It doesn't become faith. A simple illustration that maybe you, like me, need to be challenged with. Is it simply a belief that I have? For Martin Luther would say, that's cheap. The faith that costs me nothing is worth nothing. For years, this church has challenged people to go beyond the belief to have a true faith. There was a chicken and a pig. They were walking down the street one day together. And the chicken and the pig, as they're walking along, they saw a homeless man. And, and the chicken says to the pig, hey, let's give this guy a ham and egg breakfast. <laughs> and, and the pig says, Are you, what? Are you kidding? And the chicken says, no, come on, man, you're a pig. I'm a chicken. Let's give this guy a ham and egg breakfast. And the pig says, you don't understand what you're asking. Yours would be an offering. Mine would be a sacrifice. <laughs> Silly joke. But what have we given to God when we gave him our life? When we placed your faith in him, an offering or a sacrifice? If you're filling in the little notes like some of you like to do because OCD and you can't leave things blank, here's the first little line is that faithfulness does not come from an offering. It comes from sacrifice. It does not come from an offering. It comes from sacrifice. Where, where do we get this? Romans 12.1, I think the verse is right here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy... In view of God's mercy, because he is so merciful, I urge you, Paul tells the people in Rome, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, a sacrifice, not an offering. Not a little bit, but all of who we are. You see, because following out following Christ and living out this thing called Christianity, it will cost you. I believe Paul got this idea of a living sacrifice because of what Jesus said in Matthew 16 when he said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. If that's what you're striving after in life is to save your life, you see, to, to, to find happiness, Solomon said he would seek happiness, will forever be seeking it. When you're trying to find your life, you end up losing it in the midst of all that you're trying to do. But whoever would lose his life for me, Jesus says, will find it. So I've, I've got, these, uh, I've got these, these three questions that came up in my mind as I read this little story that I want to share with you. There are three interactions with Jesus, three interactions of these three men with Jesus, and each has a different response, and Jesus has a different response to each one of them. And as I read it, I asked myself a couple of questions. What if I had been one of those men? And I just pray maybe this Sunday, maybe today, you would stop and ask yourself the same question. What if you had been one of these? What would Jesus say to you? What would Jesus say to you? The story is found in Luke chapter 9. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to it, otherwise I'll, I'll read it to you. It's very brief. It's only a couple sentences for each story, each interaction. 
But something kept each one of these men from the sacrifice that would bless their lives. And I wonder at times what it is that keeps me from becoming that living sacrifice for God. What it is that keeps me from giving up my life that I might truly find it? The first question I thought when I read this first interaction, the first question, let me give it to you, is, is my life too full? That sounds funny, doesn't it? Because I think so often we, we think, oh, I, I want more, you know, more love, uh, more friends, more stuff. Most of us would say we want more. But I had to ask myself, is my life too full? Because I think that's what's in this first interaction. Here it is in verse 57 of Luke chapter 9. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, okay, and it would have been Jesus and his disciples and other followers, a man says to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replies, hey, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. <laughs> now, the first time I read that, I, I thought, wow, what a crazy response from Jesus. You picture it? The guy says, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Yes, well... Foxes have holes in which to live. And birds of the air, they have nests. But I have nowhere to lay my head. I think like me, you might have looked at him and gone, huh? Come on, who's with me? Why, well, I mean, what? I just said, I'm, I want to follow you. What's this about foxes and birds? What are you talking about? We know, we know from a... Another section in Scripture in Matthew chapter 8 that Matthew tells the same story, and he says that this man was a teacher of the law. You know, what was interesting about a teacher in those days was that because they could read and write, they were fairly intelligent in being able to teach others. They were kind of in an upper class. They were probably well-to-do. They probably had lots of stuff. They had lots of people who followed them, and their lives were probably quite full. Maybe it was even just FOMO. You heard that one? The fear of missing out? Life was so full, so full that Jesus said, you know what, if you follow me, you're not going to have all those things that you find so comfortable right now that you think you have to have. He doesn't have a pla nice place to lay his head, Jesus says. If you follow me, I'm going to take you out of your comfort zone. I'm going to take you out of your comfort zone. And I don't know what that is for you to say, is my life too full? To ask yourself that, is my life too full? Is there just so much going on in my life that I really just don't have the time to do anything of eternal value? Because I'm offering my life on the altar of the immediate, day after day after day. Folks, understand now, I'm not talking about like just possessions and the acquisition of stuff and, and the way that we work so hard to contain and, and purchase all of our stuff. It's not wrong to have the things that money can buy. You with me? Church, come on. It's not wrong to have the things that money can buy as long as in the process you don't lose the things money can't buy. Okay, that was good. Is this thing on? Okay? It's not wrong to have the things that money can buy. You don't have to get too excited. I just want to make sure you don't fall asleep. It's not wrong to have the things that money can buy. As long as in the process you don't lose the things money can't buy because your life is so full of all the stuff. Maybe it's the fear of missing out. And so you say yes to too many things and you have no time for what's eternally beneficial. Maybe it's the acquisition of items and they have filled, so filled your life that there's no room for Jesus got a little story for you, and some of you know that I love little stories. You're going to get a few of them this morning, and then I'll get you out of here before the Baptist to brunch. Amen? <laughs> there were these two soldiers at the end of World War II, and the, the story that I read goes that they were waiting for the ship to take them home with all, you know, thousands of other guys. And the ship shows up, and there is not room for both of them. 
uh, or for, for everyone, not room for all of them. So they do a lottery, and only one of their numbers is chosen to go on the ship, and they have to wait for another ship to come in. Well, these two guys had fought together, saved each other's lives, literally. They'd become like brothers. And now they felt very bad as one got over in line to get on the, on the, the ship to take them home. The other is sitting off to the side, and he didn't know how long it would be before he would be able to come back to America. They wanted to see each other's families. They wanted to make sure they stayed in touch. The sergeant is going down the line, and he's barking out the orders, you know. Look, the ship is totally full. You can only take home what fits in your GI issue duffel bag. Guys had all kinds of gear, all kinds of stuff. And he said, look, it's just not worth it. We want to get you home. Take only what will fit in your GI issue duffel bag. Take what's most important to you, because that's all you get. Well, that rang in his ears as he looked over at his buddy and he got out of line and he walked over towards his buddy and he dumped the duffel bag on the ground and he held the duffel bag open and he said, get in the bag. And it only came up around his waist, you know, but he cinched it up, threw the guy on his shoulders, got back in line. The sergeant saw him and said, what are you doing? He said, sir, you said bring home what's most important. I have what's most important. I read that story and, you know, it's just a cute little story, but truth is, how about you? Well, what's in your duffel bag, man? What's well, taking up all that time that God has given you? We all have the same amount of time. You see, today, you have this time. What's filling up this bag? Maybe, maybe, maybe you need to empty the duffel bag of your heart. For those of you, again, who are visual learners, picturing yourself going before the feet of Jesus and saying, Lord, I got too much stuff in my life. Get in. Get in. We assume this man in Scripture didn't follow Jesus. It, it, it doesn't say that he did. Uh, probably his life was just a little too comfortable. How about you? Is my life too full? I had to ask myself that question. I hope you will too. Second interaction. Second interaction is this. And I had to ask myself this question. Am I delaying obedience am i delaying obedience you see i'm obedient but i'm kind of delaying it full on it's like yeah lord i'm following you but yeah to really do it i'm just i will i will lord i will it's going to happen just not today look at this interaction here in verse 59 jesus says to another man hey, follow me follow me but the man replied lord first let me go and bury my father sounds like a reasonable request Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Wow, what a harsh response. Oh, Lord, I'll, I'll follow you, but, but let, me, let me bury my father. Hey, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Wow, that sounds harsh, does it not? But do you know most experts would agree? This man's father probably was not dead. In fact, most likely wasn't even sick. You with me? What he was saying is, look, my, my father's getting a little old, but I really need to be around. I'll follow you after he dies. If he was dead, he wouldn't even been over there following Jesus. You with me? He wouldn't have been there to talk to him. He would have been with the family, preparing the body for burial, welcoming all the family in to mourn. If his father was deathly ill, if he was deathly ill, he would have been by the body of his father while he was ill, hoping for the blessing from his father, hoping to hear a last word or two. So this man's father wasn't even probably sick. Well, you know what the guy was doing? He was delaying obedience. And I have to ask myself, maybe you'll ask yourself, is that what I'm doing? Am I just putting it off? Am I putting off really buying in to this thing called Christianity? Called being a Christ follower? Some of us do this all of our lives. I've done this. As soon as I get out of school, oh, Lord, so many of our students at the college, I try to challenge them about this. What are you doing for the Lord today? Oh, as soon as I get out of school, Jim. As soon as I get out of school, boy, then I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to do some great things for him. As soon as I get out of school. Then they get out of school. Well, as soon as I get a good job. I just, I just need a good job. I got to get stable, you know. My parents want me out of the house. I got to get a good job. As soon as I find the right spouse, because, you know, I mean, I'm dating this one girl right now, and... You know, Jim, once, once we really, you know, once we get married, then, hey, we're going to follow the Lord together. It's going to be awesome. Well, as soon as we get settled, you see, we got to get a house. 
We, once we get a house and, and once we get settled, and everything will really come together then in our walk with the Lord. Well, now we've got to get out of debt. See, if we were just out of debt, Jim, how much we could follow the Lord? It got really quiet in here, and you're all just kind of staring at me. <laughs> Are some of you like that? It's been me at times. And then we get older and we say, you know, as soon as my health gets better, as soon as my health gets better, I just, I just don't, don't feel real good or I've got an issue right now. We often procrastinate the important and eternal issues because we've spent all our time on the trivial and temporal ones. How many times have I asked myself at the end of the day, what did I accomplish today? <laughs> what did I do today? What did I do? I think it has to do with priorities. If I'm getting a little too preachy on you this morning and telling you I'm like that doctor came into the office, she spoke truth to me. I just had to decide whether I was going to listen. By the way, give, me a little, give you a little tip. It's not what you eat between Thanksgiving and Christmas that really matters, church. It's what you eat between Christmas and Thanksgiving. <laughs> you with me? Come on. So, you know, it's okay. You indulge, enjoy. And then when Christmas is over, start getting back on track. But are we delaying because our priorities are out of whack? Another little story you've probably heard. CEO of a large company, it was going downhill. It was not going well. The whole company, the profits were going in the tank. Morale was bad. He called in his chief execs. They're sitting around the board meeting table. He doesn't say a word. The CEO doesn't say a word. He grabs a coffee can, and he puts a coffee can up on the table, and he takes a couple of large boulders, and he puts them in the coffee can until they're sticking out the top of the coffee can. You ever heard about this one? He doesn't say a word. The executives are looking at him. What is going on? He says, is the can full? They all looked, and they said, yeah, it's full. And he said, no, it's not full. As he grabbed some rocks, and he dropped the rocks in around the boulders until the rocks showed up at the top of the can. And he said, now is it full? And they all looked, and they said, well, a couple, a couple of them still said, yeah, it's full. He said, no, it's not. As he grabbed sand, and he poured the sand in until the sand was coming out the top of the can. And he shook it, and he poured more sand until it wouldn't, no more would fit. And he said, now is it full? Only a couple of them yeah, I, I think it's full. And he said, no, it's not. As he grabbed a pitcher of water and he poured the pitcher of water in until the water came out the top of the can. He looked around his executives and he said, guys, now it's full. But what am I trying to teach you? Junior executive down at the end of the table said, uh, we can always fit one more thing in our lives. <laughs> He said, no, that's exactly the problem, he said, with what's going on at this business. We're trying to do too many things here, and you have to understand the moral of what I'm doing. The boulders had to go in first. Think about it. The boulders had to go in first. And in the walk with God, your walk with God, what are the boulders? Maybe they're what Jesus taught, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, to love your neighbor as yourself, to seek first the kingdom of God, and what would happen? All these things would be added unto you. These things you think you have to worry about, these things you think are so important and valuable in your life, all these things would be added unto you. Today, I challenge you to put the boulders in first. Again, for you visual learners, what are those boulders in your life, man? that they might go in first. You see, if we focus on the needs that we have instead of focusing on the provider of those needs, then we focus on creation instead of the creator. And honestly, truthfully, that's idolatry. It's idolatry when we focus on creation instead of the creator. But it's tough to get priorities right. Can I get an amen? amen. Good, four or five of you are with me. That's good. It's tough for me too. Did you hear about the four guys who went hunting? They broke into pairs. Two guys went off one way to hunt for a deer. A couple guys went off the other way to hunt for a deer. These two guys came back. They're sitting around the bonfire. They got nothing. They hear some rustling in the bushes. Here comes, here comes their friend Harry. He is dragging this huge buck back into camp. They go over. They help him out. Man, this is awesome. Harry, look at that thing. He goes, yeah, isn't it awesome? They said, well, where's Bob? He said, oh, Bob passed out about three miles back. They said, and you left him? He said, well, yeah, I didn't think anybody would steal Harry. <laughs> uh, Bob, steal Bob. 
That's good when you screw up your own joke. Anyways, <laughs> look, priorities. I mess them up. You mess them up. But the issue is maybe today, a new, a new day. God's mercies are new every morning. And maybe today we get the boulders in first. Well, my third question that I asked myself as I was reading this little exchange of these three men, the question was, am I stuck in the past? Am I stuck in the past? And you know what, Central Christian, some of you, I've known you for years. You've known me for years, Noni Noble. You know? You've known me for years, some of you, uh, when I was little Jimmy running around this church. And I challenged you in January that things need to change. They have to change. Because healthy things that are growing, those growing things will change. Remember that? And those growing things, that, when they change, it's going to bring pain. You're not always going to like it. But that pain means you can trust in God. And when you trust in God, that's a healthy thing. And healthy things are going to grow. And those growing things are going to change. And the change is going to bring pain. The pain will bring trust. When you trust in God, it's healthy. Remember that? Because when it's healthy, it's going to grow. And on and on. Or you'll step out of the cycle and say, no, I, I, I liked the past. I liked the way we were. I liked the way my family was. I liked the way my church was. I liked the way society was. I don't like change. Am I stuck in the past? Look at what happens here, verse 61. Still another man said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. That's a reasonable request. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Wow, that sounds harsh. Did you know in the Old Testament, Elijah asked Elisha in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah asked Elisha to follow him. Elisha said, let me go and say goodbye to my family. And Elijah said, go ahead, go say goodbye to your family. So it's not necessarily wrong what this man wanted to do, but Jesus must have known his heart like he knows yours. And he says to him this response, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for service in the kingdom of God. Wow. What must he have thought? That this man would go back and he would change his mind? Maybe. Jesus knew. He would go back and his family would say, oh, you're, you're silly. Are you crazy? You're going to follow Jesus? Like some of you may have had from your family members who said, what are you doing? Why are you at this church? Why are you following this Jesus? Why did you make this decision? Jesus knew that maybe the family would talk him out of it. Maybe he knew... He knew that this man's commitment would not stay strong if he went to the past, if he went back. If, if Jesus were speaking to us today, I think he would use a context today that we would better understand, because how many of you plowed a field this week? <laughs> not many of you, okay. He might say something like this, any of you who tries to get into his car and drive home today by only looking in the rearview mirror is not fit for service in the kingdom of God, I would add. Not fit for driving in California either. <laughs> Amen? But how, how ridiculous it would be for you to try to get in your car and look only at the rearview mirror. You with me? How ridiculous that would be. We glance in the mirror, just like he said here, you do not gaze. The, the actual word here is to gaze, to fixate back. He says the farmer who plows, he doesn't stare and fixate of where he has been. He glances back. Just like you do in the rearview mirror. What did I hit? <laughs> why, why is that guy following me so close? Is that a cop? <laughs> Come on, let's be real. This is what we do. But you glance and you look back. You're staring out the windshield where you're supposed to be, not where you have been. You learn from the past, but you stare forward. You focus forward. And folks, brothers and sisters, we cannot be stuck in the past and move forward. We must learn from our past and then move on. Learn from your past and move on. Learning, uh, living in the past and not being able to move on, wishing things would stay the same or that things had been different. Oh, living in the past is, is, is foolish and it will lead to stagnation in your own life, in your walk with God and, and for this church. 
It's easy to get stuck in the past. I looked in the mirror the other day and saw my dad. You look in the mirror and you realize, boy, it was sure better back then. You know when I was 30? <laughs> when I was 30, well, I, it was awesome because I was just smart enough to make good decisions now in life and my body could still do things that, you know, I, I wake up now in the morning and I just say, oh yeah, I hurt. <laughs> I mean, things just hurt. At 55, they begin to hurt. I would love to go back, but I also realize that God has great things in store. Oswald Chambers says, be careful of how much time you spend looking back at what you once were. When God wants you to become something, you have never been. Oh, that's a great line. Beware of spending too much time looking back at what you once were when God wants you to become something you have never been. Faithfulness is our goal as Christians, and we're in this marathon. Is your life too full for Jesus? Good question I asked myself, and I continue to ask myself. Maybe it's time to empty that duffel bag and reconsider. Are you delaying obedience? Am I delaying obedience? Maybe I need to think about putting the boulders in first. And am I stuck in the past? There are some great successes that all of us have of the past, and there are great failures of the past, but we cannot live there got to move on and I believe when we do we make the world a better place there was a little boy who went after church went home with his daddy and his daddy just wanted to take a nap and uh, well, Sunday afternoons right good nap time especially on a rainy day his daddy just wanted to take a nap and uh, the boy wanted to play catch. Daddy, let's, come on, let's play catch. Daddy, would you play with me? Daddy said, oh, come on, son. I just, let me, let me get a nap. He, he rolled over. He's feeling bad. He thinks I should play with my son. But he, he sees on the coffee table, there's, there's a magazine. And on the back side of this magazine is a picture of the whole world. You know, out in space, the, the whole globe, the whole world. And he says to his son, son, go and get some scotch tape and, and come back. And the, boy te or the, the, the father tears that whole page out and he begins to tear it up into little pieces tears it all up, spreads it out on the coffee table, and when his son came back, he said, okay, son, I, I, I want you to put the world back together. Take the scotch tape and you put it all back together. And the boy said, oh, okay, daddy, and, and then we'll play? He says, yeah, and then we'll play. Well, daddy rolled over on the couch and he's thinking, I got, I got a good 45 minutes, man, that's gonna be a tough one for this kid. And he gets all cuddled in, uh, snuggled into the couch, you know, and about 10 minutes later, the boy's tapping at his shoulder, Daddy, Daddy, I'm all done. I'm all done. The dad thought, wow, this is crazy. He rolls over and he looks, and sure enough, it was all done. There it was, the world put all back together, all scotch tape everywhere, but it was done. And the father said, son, how did you do that? And the little boy said, oh, Daddy, it was easy. See, on the other side was a picture of a man. And when I got the man put together right, the world was right. There is a cost to faithfulness to take us beyond belief to truly trusting him, sitting down in the chair. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for the opportunity for me to share in the inadequacy of my words. I pray that your spirit was at work within the hearts of some here who just needed to be reminded of something old, something that's been in the scriptures here for years, it's been in front of us for years and maybe we just never really stopped to ask the question, how might you respond to us if we were to say, Jesus, I will follow you? How would you respond to us, oh Lord? I pray we can empty the duffel bag of our heart Fill up that coffee can with the boulders first. Oh boy, that we could, we could move forward. I thank you, Father, for uh, Tim and the other pastors of this church. I thank you for the elders, the leaders here. And I thank you for these, my brothers and sisters, as we come together to worship you this morning and to learn just a little bit more, to be reminded of this truth 
Father, thank you for your grace and your mercies that are new every morning to love us right where we are. I thank you, Father, for the great relationship we've had with William Jessup University and Central Christian Church over the years. And as I know together, Lord, we can change the very landscape of eternity by your power. And it's by your son we pray.